it is my pleasure to um, be the chair of the first keynote session, uh, which is given by Thomas Thum. Um, I do not want to steal so much time of Thomas' keynotes because we are already a little bit um, <clears throat> um, behind the schedule. So I will just give you a few um, notes on the background of Thomas, and then he can go into detail about his research. Uh, so I just was thinking about where I met Thomas first, and I came to the conclusion that it was SPLC 2011 in Munich, which was a really nice uh, edition of uh, Munich, uh, of, uh, of the SPLC. And we were both uh, very young PhD students back then, and we I think we both enjoyed the very vital community spirit of SPLC, which uh, is uh, alive also nowadays. And so it's uh, it's a really pleasure for me to um, to the, uh, chair this session exactly ten years after that. Uh, so just a few notes on Thomas' background. Uh, he received his um, PhD in the group of Gunther Sake in, at the University of Magdeburg in 2015. And he received the dissertation award 2015 of this university for um, for his work, and uh, also um, it's a software engineering award of the Ernst Denard Foundation. And from 2015 to 2019, he was postdoctoral researcher at the TU Braunschweig and the group of Ina Schäfer. And since to, since 2000. 20, Thomas is full professor for the construction and analysis of secure software systems at the University of Ulm. His working areas spread from software engineering and formal methods, as well as also artificial intelligence and security. He has co-authored more than 100 peer-reviewed publications, including major conferences like ICSI, ASE, and FSE. And his main focus is on variability and evolution of software systems, and he is well known for his substance, substantial contributions to the famous open source project Feature ID, which I think all of us know very well. And so this is, I think, enough from my side, and I will pass the token to Thomas, and I'm really looking forward to your keynote, Thomas, please. Thank you, Malte, for the kind introduction. Uh, hello and welcome to everyone to the System and Software Product Line Conference, also from my side. Uh, a big thank you also from my side uh, to the whole organization team, uh, uh, for the whole organization, and also uh, inviting me. It's really an honor, and I'm looking forward to this keynote. So in my keynote, I want to answer two questions. Where are my constraints and what are they constrained? And the, these are the first and uh, second part. And Malta already said I'm involved with tool development. So this will be the third part of the talk. Before we go into this question, where are my constraints? Uh, I'm talking about constraints between features. So we need to look, have a look at what are features. And where are these features? So my claim here is, uh, uh, as a hypothesis, uh, features are everywhere. So in case you need any evidence, I will give you some examples here. Uh, cars uh, are, for instance, configurable. You have several features to choose from, not only the color and wheels, but also things that are relevant to the software. And if you ask Google for a configurator and you not specify which one, you will get eight out of 10 results as car configurators. So this is a huge thing. Uh, and then there's uh, the major thing uh, the community is focusing on in many of the studies as a benchmark, this is Linux. And some of my colleagues would say, when I start uh, talking about Linux, if Linux would not exist, your research would not be needed. There might be something true about this, but not as, uh, I would not agree completely. Uh, so, of course, there are things that are more challenging for Linux and not for every product line, but I will also come to this later on. Let me give you another example. Features are everywhere, for instance, in integrated development environments, uh, such as Eclipse. Eclipse comes with several uh, downloads on the web page. You have a version, a product for Java development, but you also have versions for C++ development, for instance. And there are a lot of features here. Uh, these features are kind of more like high level features in the Eclipse uh, ecosystem. They are called rather like solutions. And uh, beyond those solutions, those solutions are typically separate update sites. And from these update sites, you can install several features. 
Last year at SPLC, there's also been an inspiring talk uh, that uh, what we do in research can not only be applied to systems and software uh, product lines, but also to financial products. So even financial products share commonalities and have variabilities in there that can be modeled by features. And this study has shown what is the advantage of uh, doing so. And uh, another famous example uh, for features uh, are printers, where we can choose a lot of features. Uh, there are even more features than I think would be necessary. And uh, my personal experience with printers is that their quality over time decreases, right? So every time I have to buy a new printer, uh, the printout is getting worse. And uh, there are also uh, official tests um, uh, saying that. And there are also sometimes problems, but I will come to that later. Features are everywhere. Uh, there's a, a map uh, of the world, and these are places from where people have sent me an email. So, and the email was about product lines and about features. So, this is a topic that is, uh, uh, yeah, researchers and practitioners are working on this on features. Uh, worldwide, and uh, there seemed to be something uh, behind this, and I will later on uh, acknowledge why I'm doing these weird statistics about my emails. So to come to this question, where are my constraints? Uh, we need to, we have seen these features, but there's something in between features and constraints, and this is feature interactions. So I will, in this talk, you probably, some of you are aware of feature interactions and have seen some of the feature interactions uh, before. Uh, in this talk here, I want to give you some uh, very, uh, yeah, uh, personal uh, feature interactions that I experienced uh, in the last years. So one thing is the feature interaction that I've experienced with Android apps. So this is a screenshot that I made uh, for this talk, but it's uh, roughly uh, representative uh, for the situation in 2012. Uh, when I had these apps installed on my device, probably even more than that. And uh, one of those apps that I was using uh, was the baby monitor. So what does a baby monitor do? A baby monitor helps you to monitor your baby. What does that mean? Uh, your baby is sleeping, and when you want to go far away, then you can would hear the baby, then you can use this app and uh, start it. When you leave the baby, then it uh, will recognize whether the baby is sleeping or awake. And if it is awake and crying, then it will give, uh, there's a countdown, and it, then it will give an alarm. And this app worked in a way that it gave us a call to another phone, right? So... My wife back then didn't have a smartphone, so it was just giving a call. So, but uh, we've used this for several weeks, but once it didn't work out, so we came to the baby, it was crying and uh, the baby monitor was not calling us. So what happened? Uh, on the mobile phone, I've had another app installed, it's a, a Skype app. So uh, the Skype app and the baby monitor uh, can cause a weird feature in the action that makes the baby cry and me not listening it. Uh, so what was the problem? I've had Skype for several weeks already and uh, there was no problem, but there was an update to the Skype app. And since the update, every time you do a call, the Skype app was calling, uh, was asking you, do you want to make this call via your mobile phone connection or using Skype? And of course the baby couldn't press the button because the smartphone was too, away, uh, too far away and probably she was not capable of doing so at that time. So why do I tell you this? Uh, there are 3.5 million Android apps and we simply do not know which of those interact. And even if we know such feature interactions like this one, where to document this and who to blame? I mean, is it my fault that I haven't tried it immediately uh, before that and uh, turned off all the updates or is it Skype's fault uh, or is it the fault of baby monitor? It's probably no one's fault, right? So it it's, uh, arises from several features here. Let me give you another example. In 2019 in Braunschweig, I was giving a lecture on compiler construction. And in this lecture, I was in a real lecture room. So I was going there with my laptop and an HDMI cable and I connected it to the Beamer. And you already see what's happening. 
Uh, so I was giving the lecture for like 50 minutes and nothing happened. And then the beamer turned on and off again. And the worst part about this was it started with something like one or two seconds and later on it was something like a minute or so. So it was even longer uh, interval. So I'm guessing in this case, it was more software related because kind of the time the beamer was, uh, was showing a black picture uh, was doubled every time. So this interaction obviously involves software and hardware. Where to document this? Who to blame? Uh, and how to find out earlier than during the lecture? And the third and last example in the last two terms, I've created a new lecture on software engineering. And as I created this new lecture, uh, I thought that there will be probably many bugs in there. So uh, I uh, opened a bug bounty program saying that if you find any problems with my uh, lecture, you, can, you will get a bug bounty at the end. And I didn't announce what it will be. I decided that it will be some merchandising. So the uh, students were supposed to choose something from the merchandising shop of the University of Ulm. Uh, so they had different logos to choose from. They had uh, different uh, t-shirts, uh, sweatshirts in different colors and they could also choose the size. So on the right, you've seen the uh, uh, subset of the order and you already see a feature in the action here. Maybe you do not recognize it. So I will let you know. After three days since I put my order in, I got an email which was kind of personalized. Uh, some, so a human was actually involved in this process and they found out that there's a problem, sorry for this German email, I'm translating everything, and uh, they are asking me for a solution. Or I can choose whether I want to fix something or keep it as it is. So what was the problem? The problem was that some of the foregrounds and backgrounds were simply too close enough, enough from the color uh, that you could not see the, the logo. So that's what they warned me about, but pretty late in the process, not during the configuration at the website and not for the students, but rather in the process of ordering and even probably the day when they wanted to produce these things. So there was a human in the loop. So in one case, the student decided to have another uh, color instead and the other one just uh, kept it. And we bought this one and it was really not visible, the logo. So it was good to be, to be aware of this. So this feature interaction has nothing to do with software. It is easy to document uh, in contrast to the previous two feature interactions, and it can, could be easily checked automatically, even if Spreadshirt uh, decides to not check feature interactions while people are designing things, but rather when they order things, right? So it's, which will probably give some repeated effort. So there's some bottom line behind all those that every unwanted feature in the action waits to be fixed or at least documented in form of a constraint, right? So when we talk about software product lines or system product lines, we typically want aim to fix that, but that's not always possible. And in these cases, at least we want to document it. So now we finally arrived at the question, where are my constraints? And I will show you where constraints are. And my first question is, and you can give thumbs up, thumbs down. Have you seen this table before? It's the Lenovo compatibility matrix, or, uh, and it has several columns. Uh, there are actually uh, something like 30 columns here for different laptops of a certain kind. And then there are rows, something like 1,000 rows here, some high hidden uh, for different um, uh, options uh, that you can choose from. And then there are these small numbers uh, in the crosses, which mean that this is a feature in the action, but it's documented in natural language. It basically says, well, these two will only work together if you have the following configuration of the laptop or the following configuration of the uh, utilities that you're uh, using the laptop with. Uh, so there are many of them. Uh, this is just one table in one Excel file. So there are eight Excel files and the first already has 32 such tables and uh, there are a lot of uh, rows and columns already in this table that I've shown you 40,000 uh, 40, cells. These feature interactions are documented, right? So you could say these are already constraints, they're in natural language, but they are, uh, they are documented. 
but it's up to the customer to check them, right? So it's not that this table, uh, I guess more of you have, uh, uh, have Lenovo products than those uh, that are aware of this table. Typically, you're not, you're not aware of this table when you buy something, right? You just check whether it works and if it doesn't work, then you will maybe find this table later on. But not all the constraints at Lenovo are checked by humans, uh, by customers, uh, but there are also some parts that are checked by a configurator. So this is an example when you configure a ThinkPad. Uh, for the ThinkPad, there are different combinations that are not possible. And uh, as it is uh, about marketing, they're shown in green color, right? So green means it's not possible. So over here, uh, when I want uh, to choose the last display option, I can only do this if I haven't selected mobile broadband. But if I have the, selected the other one, I will get this uh, very informative uh, error message saying invalid configuration. And by the way, this error message will keep there uh, being there no matter what you click until you fix that problem. But you have to remember what was the problem. Uh, so another example of a configurator that tries to enforce constraints, but uh, at least I found a leak in there. Um, that's the Toyota uh, configurator for cars. And I was able to configure a car where the sum of the parts with their prices do not sum up to the overall price of the car. In the next step of the configuration, the following became evident. Uh, what actually happened was that I was able to order a car with eight wheels instead of four wheels. So there were two kinds of wheels. And the question is, what would happen if I would order this? I didn't spend any tax money on this, but uh, what would probably happen is that at the production phase, there arrive eight wheels and then they need to make a decision what to do, put the other uh, four uh, wheels in the back of the car or something like this. So these are different uh, ways how to express constraints and uh, how to, uh, how to enforce them. And uh, expressing constraints, there are many options and many of, of those are known to you, right? So we have uh, all, uh, sometimes the option to just enumerate all valid configurations. We have seen the examples of natural language constraints. Uh, there are compatibility matrices as, uh, as by Lenovo. Sometimes there are rule systems, which where the rules have a particular uh, structure like an implication and on the left you can have a single feature or an end connection on the right hand side a single feature or an or connection and then there's propositional logic where you can basically uh, do everything even it might be very large uh, to do this in propositional logic and there are different kinds of variability models like decision or feature models and now the question is independent rather independent of how you express it when to enforce those constraints uh, first of all, there could be no systematic enforcement or the enforcement is kind of at runtime when it's sometimes even too late. Uh, it could be at load time or compile time. When you think of software, uh, it makes a difference whether, I mean, sometimes you compile the program and it's loaded several times. Uh, so that uh, could make a difference uh, when we talk about software. And a design time would mean that the constraints are already kind of checked while you're writing the code, for instance, right? So when we talk about the software and it's not quite easy to map these uh, everyday uh, examples uh, to, to this strategy, but you see that there's at least a trade-off how soon in the process or how late these constraints are checked. And also the question, is it automated or not? So right now, I would like you to get in touch with other community members. So I will, in a couple of seconds, open uh, breakout rooms where you are supposed to answer the following question. What is your favorite example of a feature interaction? So I'm pretty sure that many of you uh, have good examples and why not sharing them with some of your colleagues? So what we assume now is that you take the ones uh, sitting next to you, but we will do this virtually. So we will assign you to uh, one of the break, uh, breakout rooms. Okay, so, so we, one was the three-way call forwarding from the telecommunications domain, a classical example. And then someone had remembered a Linux issue. And there was also a very recent one on a, you, you plug a mouse and then somehow you, you managed to reach admin rights on a computer. I think uh, Diego, um, 
publish those uh, link on the on the chat. Okay, thanks. So people are joining back now. Okay, thanks. So misconfiguration on my side, uh, you've had uh, between five, uh, four and six minutes. Uh, so some of you have chosen to take the six minutes and some of you four minutes. Uh, thanks for Maurice uh, for jumping in uh, to fill the two minutes. Um, so let's continue with the talk. So ideally you have heard of some uh, feature interaction that you were not aware of, uh, and maybe you have just seen some other participants of the conference. So to continue in the next part, I would like to talk about what is the meaning of constraints and uh, why does it matter and how can we find out about that meaning, right? So what are uh, those constraints actually constrain? So why does it matter? It matters, for instance, if we want to understand whether those constraints that we made up uh, are actually, uh, whether they are still unwanted feature interactions in the programs or uh, whether there are more general uh, some products that are faulty. I have one example here. There are plenty of them, but I found this uh, to be very interesting. Uh, there was, uh, in uh, eight years ago, there was uh, something found out uh, about Xerox uh, scanners and printers uh, that they've had uh, some flipped uh, numbers uh, uh, in their scans. And the problem, Mrs. Buck, is uh, on the one hand side, it was found in 2013, but it was in the scanners already for eight years. So there are eight years of scanned documents at companies, uh, at whatever government and so on, which basically have no legal value because whenever they contain numbers, it could be that there's also some other number in there, or at least the legal value is problematic. Uh, what happened here is that not all the systems were affected. It's actually not a feature interaction. It's rather something that is specific to a feature rather that they chosen a certain pattern matching algorithm. And this algorithm did not affect all the products, but a lot of products. And for those products, it was also kind of dependent on the configuration that you've had, right? So it's kind of interesting for us in a sense that it's dependent on the type of hardware that you have and the runtime software configuration that you have. So clearly, this is just uh, one example of many. Uh, we need to test our products. We need to make sure that they do what they uh, should do, what we, what we ask them to do. And the boost for the st strategy to do so is to reason about the variability in the following way. So we use the product line, including the constraints here marked as a feature model. And we use the domain implementation. Here are some uh, Lego parts. And we use the constraints and the parts to actually build all the different combinations that are valid and check whether they are as uh, intended. So in, uh, uh, while this is uh, a reasonable strategy, if you have a very small product line, it obviously comes a problem uh, for larger product lines, which is known. Uh, but uh, here for illustration, uh, we've recently counted the number of valid configurations for some large configuration spaces. And these uh, configuration spaces had something between uh, 100 uh, features and something like 10,000 uh, features. So in this range, we found uh, a lot of difference. And uh, let me uh, point you to the y-axis, which is in logarithmic scale. And it's not only in logarithmic scale, but there are huge gaps in between. So we have 25 digits. So when you go one, one uh, step up, it's 25. The number that you have has 25 digits more, or 24. So uh, in this example, we've looked at different systems that are publicly available, some systems modeled in CDL, some um, systems modeled in K-Config and uh, uh, also some automotive models, which are uh, systems that we got access to from our industry partner. And for the automotive system, it was interesting because we also had the evolution. So we had uh, 50 to uh, 150 versions of those models. And you see uh, the plot showing the, the numbers for the different versions here. 
So these are huge numbers and even like the, the lowest value is something like 10 to the power of 26, like numbers with 26 digits uh, are already huge. And, uh, but uh, in some cases, and I will come to this uh, later on, we were not, it was not possible to compute it, uh, but some uh, extra point was not be able to show in, in the diagram, we can even uh, have spaces up to 10 to the power of uh, 1500 uh, configurations, which is incredibly large. Okay, but most of the automotive product lines are uh, more constrained, let's say it like this, and have something uh, between, let's say, 10 to the power of 13 or 23 uh, as for the automotive form. So what we did is uh, we're working with, with industry and uh, also with students. And from time to time, we see that people try to enumerate all them. So, and what we did was uh, creating a video uh, that I will show you now in which we try to emphasize one of the problems. One problem that you have is you run out of time, but you could always argue we can have smarter and faster computers do more in parallel. So we thought for this video, we will look at what's, uh, uh, what about the space constraints that we have. So assume we have a feature model with 1000 features and with a very strong compression rate, it needs one byte to store a single configuration. So on a Blu-ray disc, not sure who remembers those, uh, has 100 gigabyte capacity. You can store 10 to the power of 10 of those valid configurations. That's not enough for the automotive systems, but if I take a stepper that is as high as I am, I can already model automotive four uh, in one of the first versions. But when I look at the later versions of the same product line, so we had five versions uh, of that product line, uh, the Eiffel Tower is not enough. Uh, the uh, complete, I mean, going once through the complete Earth is not enough. But we rather have to pile up all our Blu-rays to from the Earth to the Moon. So from the Earth to the Moon, we get uh, a number of configurations of 10 to the power of 22, and that was. Uh, reasonably close to what, what the last version of the same product line was about. And what about the other product lines? So even if we would cover the whole earth with these piles of blue rays to the size uh, until the moon, we are not still not able to express the other industrial product lines, automotive five or automotive two. So uh, while this is uh, uh, one thought experiment, uh, let's look why, why this is interesting. Um, let's look into this from another perspective. There are different complexity levels for these product lines. And something, every, every product line that I'm aware of, uh, the following is at least possible. You can check whether there's a valid configuration. So in other words, this is known as void feature model or consistent feature model and so on. And if you look into papers from our community, it's very likely that there, there's the implicit and assumption that the feature model is not void because otherwise you cannot sample, you cannot uh, compute dead features or whatever, right? So there are check for compiler errors. This is the typical assumption. And it's if we would have a product line where this is not feasible, then we have larger problems. So then there's the, the next, and there could be other levels, but I'm just focusing on those levels here. So the next level would be, it's feas we are feasible, it's feasible to compute the number of valid configurations, uh, which is also known as model counting. So that's what we did for some of the product lines in the previous slides. And if you are able to compute all the valid configurations, if you can enumerate all, then you also know the number, right? So it's the next level, whether you are able to actually enumerate all, and that was the story of the previous video with the Blu-ray uh, uh, stack. Uh, there's a huge difference between level two and level three, right? So there are many product lines for which we can count the number of configuration, but not enumerate. All. And then of course, there are the next steps, like if you can enumerate all the configurations, uh, can you also generate the sources? If you can generate the sources, can you compile all them? So for Linux, uh, compilation might take uh, several hours for just a single configuration, for instance, and testing might take even longer and it requires the compiled product. So these are stages and let me uh, give you some examples on uh, int or interesting cases uh, in between some of the levels. So 
two of the industrial models from the automotive domain, we were simply able to compute for all the versions, uh, all the numbers, right? So something uh, in, in a second or something like this. And then there's uh, Automotive 5, for which we were able to compute the first versions. So these started uh, somewhere like 10 years ago. So this is the time span for Automotive 5 of 10 years that you see here. And for these uh, uh, first years uh, that we see in the timeline, we were able to do so, to compute it. And for the last ones, we even tried to uh, run the, let the computation run for months, and we were not able to compute it. So even a single product line might step from one version to the next version to another complexity level in this sense. There are a couple of product lines with unknown number of configurations. Uh, for instance, Linux, this is one of the uh, hidden uh, ones in the table here because it's uh, one in the uh, uh, kconfig format. And the other one was from the automotive industry that we've seen. And another example that at least I'm not aware of someone that was able to compute a number for Eclipse, for instance. And one of the reasons for Eclipse, it's, it's an open ecosystem and it's even hard. Uh, we could look at everything that's in the marketplace at the moment, but it's hard to, to even find all the update sites that are uh, flying around somewhere in the web. So now that we've looked at the boot first strategy, what, can, what else can we do? Uh, of course, there are other strategies and people looked into this uh, like 20 years, uh, starting 20 years ago and still uh, there's research on this. Uh, there's feature-based analysis where you try to look at features rather than combinations of features. But a fundamental problem with this approach is that you cannot identify features by analyzing single features uh, in isolation. Right? If, you, if I analyze the baby monitor app, I will not find this interaction with Skype. Um, there are some circumstances where people try to do as much as possible in a feature-based manner and then do something else to take uh, care of the feature interactions. I will not talk about this in detail. And there are family-based analysis that try to uh, look at all the combinations, but do, do this uh, typically by means of self solving or something like this to formulate constraints to solving. And then there's, if it's not sufficient to just aesthetically check something, right? We cannot aesthetically check every interesting property. Sometimes we need to do testing, for instance, in the automotive industry, you at least need to buy, uh, to build a couple of those cars and try out them. And uh, what they do there in practice, but also there's a lot of research on this is sample-based analysis, right? So you compute a subset of the valid configurations that have some nice properties and what is, and this is typically uh, delegated to SAT solvers, but there are also other solvers involved. So why reasoning with solvers, why SAT solvers? I think it was a very smart decision from the community and uh, uh, also some of the members uh, still here today um, to decide 20 years ago to use these SAT solvers because they have made large progress, right? So the, uh, the graphic is a bit generalized, uh, but it has gives an overall picture of the performance of these systems. And they're much larger than what we have in the product line community, at least for a single set call. So now the question comes, is it due to new hardware or new algorithms? And there was a study on this, the time leap challenge. And the basic response was, it's due to both. So there were advances in the algorithms and in the hardware, and they were about the same. So algorithms were a little bit more contributing to the, uh, to the power. Uh, but there's something uh, interesting for researchers, but also for, uh, for practitioners behind this picture, because you always have the chance to develop your own algorithm to do the set solving in the back end, uh, and or even parts of the set solving, or to use an existing algorithm. And why you need to buy some new hardware anyway after, uh, after a while of time, your own algorithm will not improve automatically. But the open source versions of such solvers, they improve every year. So there's every year uh, new solvers and there's even meta solvers, which are even faster than regular solvers. So while all this is considering uh, just a single SAT call, we typically have more than a single SAT call in the community. So we have several things. If you want to compute a sample, it's not just solving a single SAT problem, but a couple of SAT problems. 
And in this sense, it's sometimes beneficial to do knowledge compilation. So what you do is you have some offline computation, you do something, uh, you produce some artifact, and with that artifact, you're faster afterwards to do something. So in this example, we produce, we propose a new data structure called modal implication graphs. So it's an extension of implication graphs, which have just direct, uh, direct implications between variables or negated variables. And these modal implication graphs have a different kind of edge, saying a weak edge, and only for weak edges, I have to do a set call, and for the other strong edges, there's no need for a set call, and that's how we can save some set calls. And uh, we've shown that this uh, improves the speed of configuration, but also improves uh, the generation of samples, which in the end is, can be reduced to configuration too. So uh, a short wrap up, uh, there, is, there are several ways to express these constraints. We've discussed this before, and now there are desired properties for them. So first of all, they should be machine readable and unambiguous. Why? Because we want to reason about them with machines, with algorithms. So natural language is not a choice then. They should be explicit, the constraint, right? So there is some research I know for going from valid configurations to a feature model or to constraints, but uh, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence and we cannot do this every time we want to reason about something. So constraints should be explicit. It should be expressive enough. So these compatibility matrices, uh, for instance, are probably not expressive enough. Uh, we have uh, evidence uh, in industrial relationships that uh, the, the list of rules uh, in this pattern are not uh, sufficient. And what we also want to have is an hierarchical uh, organization. So that's at least from my experience that this is very helpful uh, to divide large configuration spaces. Uh, and then we only have uh, feature models left here in our list. In addition, we want to have them human readable and I will want to point to the Modvar initiative. There was a workshop also related to that initiative on Monday. Uh, where we are as a community working towards a vision of human readable uh, or easily editable uh, feature models. And something that uh, I think is interesting to look at for the future is to have restricted visibility for constraints. So we're seeing more and more the problem of these large configuration spaces in practice uh, where people are not able to reason about them. And they are not, I mean, they are able to edit them, but they will break something in another part, right? And it's kind of interesting to see that there's a large gap between we are software engineers and we know how to build software, modularized and so on, but this concept has not been successfully applied uh, to feature models. In my, my eyes, I know that there's some work on modularization of feature models but if we are still not there yet that we can define a constraint and say it only focuses on this part of the model and cannot uh, make any harm to any other part. So again, we will use the breakout rooms. Uh, this time I will try uh, to have four minutes. Um, and uh, the idea is that you now have a short discussion on how is your research connected to constraint, right? So the idea is to get in touch with others, talk about your research, uh, but there's probably also some connections to constraints. So let me try to um, uh, wrap up the talk uh, a bit faster in the, in the third part. Um, so where's tool support, right? I mean, there are several challenges uh, that uh, require tool support and where does the tool support come from? And I rather want to give you a personal experience uh, on this. So in 2007, I was studying computer science and at that time I was uh, looking for a team project. I needed this for my study. I was asking Christian Kessner at that time who was a PhD student at Magdeburg. He said, Thomas, you can fix that tool. Uh, so there was a master a student who developed it. Uh, it was, uh, there were three students in uh, the previous term that tried to fix it. Uh, they failed to do so and we want to start from scratch. Do you want to join? I joined with two other students and we implemented this tool. And I also had something else that I asked Christian, do you have an internship for me? So uh, Christian said, okay, you can go to Austin. Uh, I've been there in the last uh, past term, so you can go there too and visit dormitory. So I did this and I was very proud because I programmed for half a year on the tool and uh, it was a tool that can show a feature model. Uh, I wrote this feature model editor 
and I was very proud. Uh, Don was listening to me and said afterwards, well, the tool looks nice and now let's do some research. So read this paper here uh, and find out whether there's something that, uh, whether there are some patterns missing. So it was about refactoring. So I wrote my first paper draft, got commenced by Don. And this was kind of the beginning when I started to do research uh, instead of only doing uh, tool development. But since that time, I'm doing kind of both. Uh, the tool is known as Feature ID, and there was a logo back then. But uh, probably some of you know uh, the newer version uh, of the logo, but also newer versions of the tool. So let me at least very briefly uh, uh, give you an impression what happened in the last more than 10 years. So in 2009, we decided to make it open source. There have been releases before that. But uh, at the moment, they are gone because the website is offline. Unfortunately, we'll have to check whether we can find them, the earlier releases. Um, there are new versions where we have had new layouting algorithms because we found out it doesn't scale well. We were able to detect dead features in there and constraints causing dead features. And we also had a nice legend so that everyone could use it for his papers or her papers. Uh, then we introduced colors. So the idea of colors was that you can trace your features in the source code. So you can use different colors, assign them to features, and then find the, the source code accordingly. And then we've had explanations for uh, that features as one of the features uh, where you see here there's a textual explanation why a certain feature is dead. And we've later on turned this into visual explanations that can even give you a level of confidence. So Red means that's something very likely to, to be the problem and black is something that is not so relevant but could also be relevant. So these are uh, a couple of things that happened. There's more to show about feature ID, what we implemented. There's also a lot of uh, support to actually compose uh, domain artifacts. And uh, the latest release that we published last week uh, is actually uh, focused on the universal variability language and has a much better integration of this, even though we know that we are not there yet. Uh, the feature ID source code over time, uh, it was uh, getting increasingly bigger, of course, over time. We have now uh, 120,000 lines of code. This excludes extra branches, extra forks, uh, or some experimental uh, project. This is just the productive code that you will uh, be able to install and the features, and some of the features are even uh, distributed over several plugins. So the source code is even modularized. So the map that I've shown you earlier were not emails to me about anything, uh, but rather about feature ID, of course, related to product lines. Uh, and in the meantime, we know that feature ID, at least at some point in time, has been used in 98 cities. So if your city is missing, just send us a support request, and then we can break the 100. Uh, we've written a book uh, on uh, the experience uh, of 10 years, and uh, it's, uh, it was a nice experience. I mean, back then it was like either I finish my PhD or I write this book. So I finished my PhD and afterwards uh, contributed to the book. Uh, and even though the, the book says it's both for practitioners and students, maybe also researchers find something in it. There are many contributors. Uh, this is the current team and there are a lot of former members. Uh, so the typical development structure is that we have some team projects as I started in one uh, where students develop something. And sometimes uh, let's say in two thirds of the cases, uh, it finds its way into productive code. Uh, let me, uh, yeah, uh, there are a couple of people that are especially relevant for the project. Sebastian Krita is probably the one that's produced the most code of Feature ID and is the, the uh, architect uh, behind Feature ID. And there are Thomas Leich, Gunter Sack, and Ina Schäfer. And without their continuous support over the time, also financial support, which is kind of hard to find for tool support, uh, without that, uh, we wouldn't be uh, so large, have a, such a large. Uh, code base. Uh, when I'm saying thank you, I also want to thank uh, my team in Ulm, uh, which are PhD students and uh, uh, undergrad students. Uh, I would like to thank them and special thanks to Karl for supporting me uh, during the presentation or creating the presentation. Um, 
Also another a big thank you to all my co-authors. And let me finish uh, with this, uh, with something that you can take from this uh, talk, something I found interesting as well as for uh, development of our own tools, but also for our research. One is choose features wisely. So John Smart said that there are actually two kinds of features. There's uh, those that are asked for, uh, those that are needed and those that are delivered. And you really want to have the, those delivered that are actually needed and not necessarily those that are asked, people ask for. And there's another way to say this, uh, John Carmack said, the important point is that the cost of adding a feature isn't just the time it takes to code it. The cost also includes an addition uh, of an obstacle to future expansion. So the trick is to try uh, to pick the features that don't fight each other. Meaning that in, in our community, it could mean rather focus on features that don't have feature interactions with each other. So in my talk, I was talking about features. I was talking about feature interactions, how we can uh, document them in constraints. And I was talking about different strategies, how to deal with this uh, strategies also um, uh, that we also see in practice and <clears throat> how true support can, can work on this and help for this case. Thank you for your attention and sorry for the delay. So thank you, Thomas, for the very inspiring talk. Um...